you're welcome back to morning express now our next uh, discussion on the line of this morning it's a uh, world site day 2024 and of course uh, raising awareness on eye care and preventing blindness is the theme of this year's world site day and we are currently being joined by dr chinawa ndubisi elijah who is a um, senior consultant of Tomic, uh, surgeon and at the university of uyo teaching hospital or university of uyo teaching hospital and founder of uh, siloam eye foundation now dr ndubisi is also an eye care advocate and has been involved in different blindness prevention projects across the country and beyond he has performed and supervised about 5,000 eye surgeries in the past nine years. He's also involved in rural free medical outreaches through his foundation, and he has authored several books. He's joining us virtually now from uh, uh, Uyo. Hello and good morning, Doctor. It's uh, wonderful to have you join us in the studio. All right, uh, let's uh, set the ball rolling. It's uh, World Sight Day. For you as um, an eye surgeon and a senior uh, consultant, ophthalmologic, uh, ophthal ophthalmic surgeon as well, what does this day mean? What is the significance of uh, the World Sight Day globally? It is set aside to create awareness on vi eye health. 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 And, and blindness, blindness. because in um, the sub-Saharan African region and Nigeria, it's been observed that 80% of the causes of blindness are avoidable. It means they are either treatable, therefore we know that if we can create good awareness that people will do the little they can and prevent blindness. So it's a day set aside, the second Thursday of October of every year, to create awareness on eye health and also for advocacy towards those in position of power to pay more attention on eye care because eye health is one of the most cost-effective health interventions. But unfortunately, many are going needlessly blind. Well, well uh, it couldn't have been put uh, in any better way. But in talking about awareness, I believe the focus uh, for today should mostly be in rural communities where people don't really have access to, you know, proper health care. Uh, not to talk of, uh, you know, high-end hospitals that uh, take care of ophthalmological issues and all. Uh, how, how do we ensure that outreaches, you know, get to these communities for people to checkmate and stop blindness before it occurs? is just one of the avenues we have like the ophthalmological society of nigeria we have um, different programs set out across the taxi states of nigeria you know to create this awareness not just on radio and television some people are going to different schools because the the, the core theme for the year is children love your eye so many of the musicians are going to different schools to create this awareness and also to do some kind of screening to identify children that have treatable problem so that they can benefit from this program and possibly be treated free within the limits of available resources. Then talking about the rural areas, yes, we may not cover all the catchment areas because the truth of the matter is this, that the number of health professionals in Nigeria has significantly diminished in the past five years because of what we all know that is happening, the Jaffa syndrome. But most teaching hospitals, including mine, the University of Western Hospital, have output, outposts in the interiors where we try to, you know, um, talk to and treat the rural dwellers. And that is one of the things we intend to also achieve that efforts should be made on the part of the government to strengthen the primary, eye, primary health care generally with uh, emphasis on maternal and child care and then to fully integrate the primary eye care into the primary health care because primary eye health care 
you know, emphasizes more on teaching, on reaching these rural dwellers. All right. Well, well, let's take, for example, a place like uh, in Taraba State. There is a, a particular uh, community. I, I might not be able to pinpoint the name exactly, but uh, they, I, I did a documentary there some years ago. And one of the most shocking things about that community is that more than 50 percent of the persons there are blind. And they say that most of them were not even born blind, but they suddenly and mass started developing symptoms of you know cataracts and then half of the community became blind what could have been the possible cause of of issues like this where there is mass blindness in a particular region earlier that's it's been observed that the causes of blindness in nigeria in sub sahara, -Sahara africa majorly avoidable and in a national blindness survey that was done in Nigeria between 2004 and 2007, it was found that the prevalence of blindness in Nigeria was 0.78. That means that in a population of about 200 million, about 1.4 million are blind. And it's also observed that the leading cause of blindness from that survey was cataracts that contributed 49, 42.9% of the burden of blindness. And I was happy to hear you mention that you, there were cases of cataracts in the exercise we carried out in Taraba State. So cataracts causes could be one of the causes of the, of the blindness there. And the, the unfortunate thing is that cataracts causes reversible blindness. It's blindness that is amenable to treatment with good surgical intervention. But the question now is what is the extent of coverage of, of, of this body, of extent of burden of blindness from cataracts. That's why many non-government organizations come in to augment the much government is doing. But then we are using the forum to call the attention of the government. I said earlier that eye care is one of the best active health intervention. You know, and in introduction, you mentioned about thousands of cataract surgeries that have been supervised. In this northern area, a lot of things could accentuate the prevalence of cataracts. One, the, the, the recent story done showed that they had less eye care professional in the northern region. One, and this is a challenge for the leadership in the north to accentuate the training and specialization of their experts there, and also to partner with non-governmental organization that can reach the interior and do free cataract surgeries. Apart from cataracts, the issue of trachoma had been a challenge in the north and other um, problems. But it's not something that um, the eye care professional can do in isolation. We provide the expertise, the government and other good spirited individuals. We provide the resources and the logistics. You know, you might know what to do, but you don't have the resources. That's where the organization like Ophthalmology Society of Nigeria is available, and they are willing to partner with any senator, any governor, any individual that says, I want to start with my community. You know, I, I have humorously said before that I don't know how much they sell a cow now, but people will eat the cow and forget. But if you can take that money and say, I am targeting 10 people for you know, cataract surgery and partner with the experts in your area, those people who have their vision will not forget you know, the, um, the good work you've done compared to if you have pushed China the money in other areas of you know, um, let me say health intervention. So I'm encouraging every good spirit in Nigeria that I care is a good way to put in resources to touch the lives of people. Most of the people that we see blind are revert the blindness is reversible. With good intervention, they can regain their vision. You know, from the study, it was found that glaucoma that could cause a reconstructed 16.7%. That's quite a bulk. But of the cost of blindness up to 80%, we are avoidable. So areas can still be reached, even though some have been labeled blind. But I can tell you that those blindness are reversible with good intervention.
Now, now talking about intervention, uh, Dr. WBC, you have performed or supervised about 5,000 eye surgeries in the past nine years. Uh, we also know that uh, through your outreach or through your foundation, you conduct rural free medical outreaches, especially uh, to operate, to do cataract operations and all of that. We know these operations do not come cheaply. Uh, how do you, you know, balance the cost of these operations? How do you sort of source for funding? I know it's, it's perhaps rather private, but do you get some sort of support in order to push this uh, good work that you're doing in rural communities? The support is not as expected, but we still work within the limits of available resources. As I said earlier, it's not just myself. There are many people, like I mentioned, the Ophthalmology Society of Nigeria, that someone can approach the Ophthalmology Society of Nigeria in their state and collaborate with them, they will be able, it's not just cataracts, like when we talk about children, you see many children who had gone black, corneal opacity, because they were not immunized against measles. Some children had gone blind because of malnutrition, they had vitamin A deficiency, they had xerophthalmia, eventually they had corneal dryness, corneal ulceration, and which heals with an opacity. Others have not well been educated, and they indulge in the use of harmful traditional eye medication. You know, so a child has a red eye, and they are using something like breast milk, squeezing leaves in the eye. And these are harmful practices we have seen over time. That any opportunity we have on air or physically with the people will educate them about the dangers of using local intervention for eye because a little thing can melt the eye and the person loses the, the, the sight. So what I'm trying to say is that when we talk about collaboration and sponsorship, if, if you cannot sponsor surgery, you can sponsor health education. If you cannot sponsor surgery, you can sponsor you know, bringing 45, vitamin A fortified food in your local. If you cannot uh, sponsor surgery, you can sponsor immunization in your health center in your vicinity and now coming back to the surgery itself yes to do um, um, sophisticated surgeries is quite capital intensive but on outreach basis it's from several modalities that you can do quite a number of surgeries at very low cost so this is imploring everyone starts the says charity begins at home I don't know how you can sponsor one, you can sponsor 10, you can sponsor 20. Just partner with people, the professor in your place. Every state in Nigeria have a chapter of Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria that you can make inquiry, partner with them, and you on how resources to be used. Now, now, Doctor, there is a start here that, um, you know, in Nigeria, there is an estimated, of, uh, an estimated figure of 24 million people living with vision loss and 1.3 million people being blind. Now, a further 50 million people have non-vision impairing eye conditions needing basic eye care services. If you take a look at these statistics, it's quite um, a huge start if about... 50 million people have, you know, these challenges, eye challenges, and we are a country of a little over 200 million. The figure is quite huge. What do you think is the major cause of uh, this particular problem nationwide? Let's not now just narrow it down to rural communities, but even in urban cities like where I am and where you are. I'm happy you mentioned the figures. And it will interest you to know that out of that figure, a good percentage are just refractive errors. Refractive errors, eye problems that are amenable to use of corrective spectacle. Like I said earlier, that the emphasis in the year is children love your eyes, and we are going into the schools to screen children that the teachers have observed to have problem with writing so that they can be corrected and given glasses. So a large percentage, apart from the I mentioned earlier, those children or adults that just need corrective lenses. I will agree with me that 
um, providing glasses won't be as costly as doing surgery. And why it is, especially as it regards to the, the um, this year's team, is um, there's what I call a sensitive or plastic period of it. That's like zero to seven to eight years. This is the period that if a, a child has a, a, any form of visual impairment, efforts should be made to correct it at that age. Because that age, the child will develop what is called amblyopia. Amblyopia is a, a, a depression in, in vision that may not be corrected be, beyond that plastic age period. And you will agree with me, the reality of a child. The child cannot tell you he has an eye problem. The child cannot express himself. So it causes index of suspicion from both the doctors, the teachers, and the parents to observe their child. Does the child close one eye to see something? Does the child bring the book close to his face when reading? Is there a history of someone who has gone blind in the family from an unknown cause? These are things to look out for, and it should motivate our health-seeking behavior. I've said on air before, that one challenge we have in African setting, especially Nigeria, is that we have not developed a good health-seeking behavior, and that we not separate that from the economic situation in, in the country. People want to eat first before they seek health attention. So when you have noticed this thing in your child, it's enough reason to seek intervention. The child is drawing close to television, drawing close to his book, squinting it, there is a history of um, blindness in the family of unknown cause. The, eye, the child has a teary eye. The child cannot withstand light. At that time, it's important that the child is corrected. It may just be a simple refractive error that requires glasses. And that gives me the opportunity to correct the myth about eyeglass wear. So I think that you know, when a child wears glass, it uh, it's further damages the eye. But a child that wears glass is... Um, is socially stigmatized. Glass wear in children, even in adults, is ac it actually accentuates eye health. So that uh, figure you give, as correct as it may be, are uh, something that can be re the burden can be reduced significantly with the right intervention. And that's why we are creating this awareness for, for teachers, for parents, for for people that work in the primary health centers. Once you notice any of these things I've mentioned, the person should be encouraged to an eye care professional for adequate intervention. If we join our hands together, we do that. So not before the burden of blindness drops significantly, even in our own climb, Nigeria. Now, now, Doctor, you earlier mentioned the issue of uh, stigmatization, especially amongst children, uh, where if, so, if a child is wearing glasses amongst his peers, is often stigmatized and, as we all know it, referred to as four eyes, which is uh, some sort of derogatory term that uh, most people use to describe people who wear glasses. How do we ensure that uh, such cases of stigma are curtailed within the Nigerian society, uh, especially amongst children who might not really know any better? That's why I'm talking about the teachers, the parents, religious leaders, and the doctors themselves, you know, being observant to have a high index of suspicion. Because when a child is visual, it does not just affect the person's academic life. The person's uh, uh, social life is affected because the, the social inclusion that a child for optimal development development is lost. And even physically, the, the child cannot really interact with nature. For a child who is short sighted, highly biopic, he only sees his immediate environment. He can't see far. He can't interact with nature. So when the parents understand the gravity of um, impairment of vision, that is not just affecting the child's academics, it's, it's going to affect the social life and um, um, in their interaction with, with nature. The parents should be motivated to counsel the child to use the glasses. And also, it's something that the teachers will also help us to educate the pupil in the class and the students in the classroom that eyeglass wear 
does not make any child less. That, so, that social stigmatization is not necessary. As we actually optimizes vision, it actually protects the eye from ultraviolet radiation. It uh, uh, protects the eye for those that are exposed to devices for a prolonged period of time and save them from eye strain from, uh, from use of devices. So the use of glass has come to stay. So uh, it's not something that um, any person wearing glasses should be stigmatized or ashamed to wear glass. Because if the correction is not affected, especially for a child with the plastic period, wearing that glass letter may be of no use. Now, we have seen uh, schools for the blind across the country. There's a very popular one. I, I believe the name is uh, Bethesda School for the Blind, where, you know, there, there's just a whole group of people who are visually impaired and they are being taught to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. They cook for themselves. You know, they learn. They, they learn how to dance. They learn how to do menial jobs that can be done by people who you know, are not visually impaired. Uh, are we seeing that more springing up of such institutions as a, um, a solution to the issue of visual impairment in the country? Do, do you subscribe to this line of thought? But, you know, when the, the case you mentioned is a case of um, people that have gone absolutely blind and they are now going through one kind of rehabilitation or the other. Yes. It is essential and encouraged, and I advocate that more you know, should spring up in all the states of Nigeria. But my emphasis today, uh, which I'm, I'm you know, putting my feet on the ground, is that we shouldn't let children get to that point where they have to only read with Braille, where they have to work with uh, Cain and the rest of them. Every effort should be made for this 80% burden that is avoidable, which is, can either be treated or preventable, to be avoided. Like I, when I mentioned vitamin A deficiency causes xerophthalmia and corneal blindness, it will interest you to know that um, an average farmer in Nigeria that has dark green leafy vegetable in his farm can just feed his children with lots of vegetable and obvious the problem of vitamin A. Encouraging breastfeeding for our young mothers will also, to a very large extent, prevent that. It's not something that we cost so much. The preventive part is cheaper. The rehabilitation part is expensive. However, we should not neglect those who have gone irreversibly blind. Those people who are the rehabilitation you talked about. And you will agree with me that such um, institutions are quite few in the country. And the few that do exist are owned and run privately. Nothing stops any state government to incorporate in their health agenda to say that, yes, we are preventing, we are intervening, but there should also be a place for rehabilitation. So I'm talking about preventing now. Let us prevent the 80% that is avoidable, that's treatable, and, uh, and, and avoidable and preventable. And while we also talk about the intervention, intervention is where the glass giving comes in, the cataract surgery comes in. Then, if the person's vision is not restorable by you know issuing glasses, giving surgeries or medication, and is now reversibly blind, that's where rehabilitation comes in. So that rehabilitation is one area that the government should also you know pay more attention in. So in every state. You should ask yourself, what is our policy for prevention? What is our policy for intervention? And what is our policy for rehabilitation? For prevention, I've taken a lot of time to talk about that. I just finished talking about you know, preventing something as bad as xerophthalmia yes. with something you can get in your garden. I've yes. talked about this by stopping some harmful practices of using local medication in the eye. I also talked about even those that have gone blind from cataracts could benefit from, from surgeries. So this education is aimed at let us make every effort to make sure that we don't have as much as 
eighty percent avoidable bottom blindness. Now, now, so now do, do, doctor, you know that, see, before you you carry on, uh, I just want you to touch I some more of intervention in the hospitals. Yes. And if intervention cannot take care of it, that's where the school of the blind comes in uh, rehabilitation. And nothing stops the government to ensure that every eye hospital in Nigeria has a cut out section for rehabilitation. Not just a section for someone trained in rehabilitative medicine, but with well equipped. Medical intervention is not just about personnel. There's a place for personnel and there's a place for infrastructure. So someone has been trained for rehabilitation, does the person have tools to work? Because if we have it incorporated in the hospitals, it will be cheaper for an average Nigerian, especially in government hospitals. Well, well, you have uh, brilliantly put it, but let's uh, still talk about the prevention. You know, many people have the notion that uh, eating carrots and stuff like that could sort of prevent uh, uh, eye problems or the deterioration of vision. Now, this is perhaps what many people believe is just a myth. But as a professional and as someone who has been in the system for, you know, well over a decade, what types of food items would you advise for people watching now uh, for them to take in order to prevent this sort of uh, deterioration in vision? I would say, no, I, in fact, I will, I will put the question with the lifestyle modifications. That exactly. Starting with food. I have always said it everywhere that will give you life is cheaper than the one that will kill you. The food will make you live long cheaper than the one that will cost death. I have said that, people have asked me, why was it that our fathers lived longer? Our fa Someone will tell me, my, my father this glass, uh, this and that. And I told them, one of that, they live farm products. They lived on natural food. Most of the success of vitamin A that is good for the eye is something you can get from the farm. It's something that is affordable. I had encouraged my family some years ago, rather than going to buy refined fruit juice that you are not sure of the preservative, why don't you buy fresh fruits from the market? If you are eating carrots, you know you are eating carrots. I'm not trying to speak against juices, but when you are eating a natural fruit, you know 100% you are taking the constituents, you are not taking the flavor. So the carrot you mentioned is highly encouraged because it has, it has a rich source of vitamin A. Not just carrots, most dark leaf, uh, green leafy vegetable, rich in vitamin A. I even mentioned breastfeeding and uh, red palm oil. These are things that are locally available. But you see people spending tens of thousands of naira in wines that you, know, you only believe what you read as the constituent constituent ingredients. But when you take your little Naira and Kobo, irrespective of the inflation we are going through as a nation, to buy the oranges, cucumber, to buy the carrots, it gives you more and helps your eye. You know, and the sugar content is not refined. It's something that the, the body to a large extent can, can handle. Because most people that are above 40 and above we come to the Risk of the rest of them. So you see that the food we eat becomes a risk for the for I. Some I, I indulge in taking a, a binge of alcohol. They may end up having alcohol um, neuropathy, alcohol in neuropathy that affects the optic nerve when taking in excess, excess, excess. So I will encourage average Nigerians go for net Africa. Go for the food you can find in your farm, especially leaves and fruits. They are rich in eye care. I mentioned that we're going to talk about lifestyle adjustment. Apart from the food we eat, another thing that we should be weary of is, um, especially in children, is indulgence in device. In my practice, I've realized many mothers bringing children with dry eye. When I was in training to be a specialist, dry eye syndrome used to be disease of the aged. But you see young people, children now coming down with dry eye, refractive error, the eye is red, the eye is peppery, they are tearing, and they are uncomfortable, missing school hours. But what interests me is 
when the mother brings the child in the consulting room to be seen, the child is fighting with the mother not to keep his device. While they are waiting to be called in, the child is on device. When, so you realize that the child, the, the, the time of exposure of the eye to phone, computer time has gone so far. People now have the eye strain syndrome. So one of the things that modified is mother teachers should encourage their children to interact with nature, encourage them to interact with nature, not just to spend hours in the device. It's been studies have shown that children may eventually abuse myopia because world is a virtual world. They live within the world of phone and system. They can't interact with nature. It becomes a problem. So it's apart from eating natural food, the time interval for children on device should be limited and quite monitored. You might as well ask me what are their job views on device like yourself, uh, 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 the bankers and all that. What I've always advocated is time yourself. You know, uh, a study showed that at least four hours exposure of device is like an, an extreme limit. So what I tell people is take intermittent breaks from, from your phone. Every human being has what we call lacrimal gland in the eye. Each time you blink your eye, it compresses the, gla the, the gland to lubricate the eye. However, when you are exposed to the device, you are reading or something, the blink rate is reduced, the lubrication is reduced, the eye gets dry with all its uncomfortable you know, signs and symptoms. So device use for those that is quite essential will involve taking intermittent breaks while using the device. Uh, there, some, uh, there was a proposal for 20, 20, 20. You re, uh, use your device for 20 minutes. You look away for something 20 meters away and blink your eye 20 seconds. But I, I, as, as wonderful as that looks, I always say it looks too mechanical. What I suggest is anytime you remember you watch a program like this, just take a break from it, take your eye away from the device, blink your eye for some time, and, um, and um, take, take a walk. Someone has said that each time your phone rings, as part of exercise, both your body and your eye, stand up and pick the call. While you are walking and picking the call, you kind of exercise by interacting, you know, with nature. Now, so now, that's now, 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 doctor, if, we, we have just your... about two minutes to, to wrap up this, this conversation. Uh, moving away from the lifestyle choices to ensure that uh, vision impairment is uh, stopped right on time. Let's talk about collaboration between uh, organizations like yours and international organizations. You've spoken about local collaborations between you and some government agencies or, you know, the ruling class and all. Do you have some sort of collaboration internationally in order to further push these outreaches that you do? In, in just two minutes. gearing towards that but of Tamil society of nigeria we have collaboration with international council of ophthalmology ico and um, the commonwealth eye and the elizabeth commonwealth sponsorship program where doc nigerian doctors are trained to so specialize it's run for some years and it's been a, a wonderful collaboration through that most nigerian doctors have been trained to so specialize in different areas we we'll collaborate for outreaches is mainly based on um, private base, in uh, non-governmental organization base. There has not been much collaboration between Nigerian government and you know foreign bodies for eye care, and that is highly encouraged. All right, uh, Dr. Chinawa Ndubisi Elijah, I must thank you so much uh, for finding the time to join us from our your studios uh, to share your deep wealth of knowledge. Uh, on this World Sites Day 2024, it's been a pleasure having this discussion with you.